All right. Welcome back, everyone, um, to our YouTube series on polymers we encounter at almost every corner of our life. Uh, the past few videos, we've focused on polymers using personal protective equipment. Specifically, we've been focusing on gloves, masks, and eye protection. As we sort of continue our exploration of polymers that keep us safe, today we're going to be exploring polymers that are designed to absorb energy. So why would we want materials that absorb energy? Yeah, that's actually really interesting. Um, you know, a lot of the time we're going to have situations where there's either too much energy coming at us or the energy is coming at us too quickly. Right, so we think some of that energy that is maybe coming at us too quickly, uh, some examples we can think of are intense or acute impacts, right? We made encounter these in sports, especially contact sports. Uh, and we definitely want the material there to absorb the impact, whether it's the sole of our running shoes or a football helmet. And we can even think of more intense versions being protection from projectiles, such as what maybe a bulletproof vest might do. Right, yeah, that's actually really interesting. Um, you know, that's uh, where we think of, you know, high energy, but really short duration um, situation. A lot of times that we're gonna have, you know, lower doses of energy, but that might be coming at us over a really long period of time. So for instance, we're doing construction work. We may not actually have very high energy um, things coming at us, but we're gonna be in high energy environments, loud environments for many hours, potentially the whole work day. So in this video, we're gonna look at some of the polymer materials that enable people to work safely in environments with either sustained or, or maybe shorter term uh, duration uh, energy exposures. And we're going to look at examples of polymers used for uh, both of these uh, strong acute impact applications and then also sustained exposure applications. Yeah, but before we get into that, um, you know, the specific polymers using these applications, let's start by talking about the sorts of properties we're going to be looking for in our materials. Right, and, and really in thinking about those properties that we need in those materials, uh, what we need to think about is what exactly we want our materials to do. Right. So we want our materials to be able to absorb energy. And to do that, they need to be deformable uh, in order to cushion whatever energy is coming at them. Yeah, and sort of in material science, we call this property viscoelasticity. Really what that means is the materials we make or the materials we're gonna be using have some component of elastic properties and some component of viscous properties. You know, we sort of have you know, ideas of what those properties might be. Right, so, so here I have a, a racquetball right? Uh, and it's an elastic material. It, it bounces really well, right? And that means it's good at storing and releasing energy. So when we take the ball, when we drop it, it stores that energy, and then it gives that energy back up uh, upon the rebound. Yeah, that's actually a really great example there. You know, the opposite side of things, right? I've got some peanut butter here, okay? Uh, peanut butter is really viscous, you know? And so when I drop some peanut butter from a height, okay, it doesn't bounce up at all, simply just sits there on the plate that we have here. And you know, when we push on it, I can deform it, and it really doesn't return back to the original shape at all. That's not what we would imagine for a racquetball. If we squeeze a racquetball, it bounces right back to the original shape. If I squeeze peanut butter, it simply spreads outwards. And really what that means is that the peanut butter, you know, when I put energy in to deform the material, it's simply giving that energy and releasing it to the environment. So, what does this mean for most polymer materials? Are, are they viscous or are they elastic? Yeah, that's actually really fascinating. Um, most polymers we're talking about are gonna have viscoelasticity. Almost all polymers have some, you know, elastic-like characteristics, but also some viscous properties. Now we can design materials that are more skewed towards the elastic end, and that's sort of what we saw with the racquetball, okay? And those materials there are really good at storing energy. So when we drop the racquetball, it bounces up to almost the same height as it bounced from. Um, you know, we can also design materials that are very viscous, okay? And those are really good at dissipating energy and releasing it to the environment. So when you think about that, how can a material be both viscous and elastic at the same time? Yeah, that's actually a really fascinating question. And a lot of it comes down to just the time scales we're talking about, what the dominant mode is. And so a really fantastic example of that is silly putty. Uh, so I have some silly putty here. On really short time scales, uh, silly putty is actually pretty bouncy, right? So it actually bounces uh, off the surface of the table pretty well and is quite elastic. 
but on longer time scales, so rather than just dropping it, having it contact the surface for you know a split second and then bouncing back up, if I pull on this silly putty slowly, I can really stretch it and have it adopt a new shape, um, you know, pretty easily. And that's sort of its viscous-like properties. Okay, so it's behaving like a viscous liquid when I stretch it slowly, but on short time scales, it actually bounces and so it behaves more elastically. Right, and, and if our viewers want to explore this in more detail, uh, they can purchase Silly Putty or they can even make their own Silly Putty at home. Uh, there's several easy recipes. One uses cornstarch and glue, and then the other uses glue and borax. And we'll actually include links to uh, these Silly Putty recipes in the comment sections of the video. So, so with this idea of uh, viscoelasticity in mind, let's move to the types of polymers and materials that uh, we're gonna use to cushion uh, and protect us and, and dissipate energy. And we're really gonna focus on two types of applications. And uh, one is, is helmets, right? So a helmet's needed when we wanna protect ourselves from acute or sharp impacts, such as when we're, let's say, working in construction or riding a bike, right? So we have a bike helmet here. Or if we're playing contact sports like football uh, or, or hockey. And you know, in these applications, we may never experience anything that really actually requires a helmet, but due to the risks of it, we should wear one because the potential impacts are quite severe. Right, yeah. Um, the other sort of end of applications we're going to focus on, uh, you know, where we're looking at ear protection from loud noises, right? And we have some earplugs here that we might need if we're going to be using power tools or if we're in a um, situation where there's a lot of loud music. Unlike a helmet, if we're going to be using these sorts of earplugs, we're realistically expecting to need to use them because we're going to be in a loud environment for an extended period of time, you know, hours, you know, uh, potentially many times over. So that kind of, you know, gets to an interesting question of, you know, what goes into a helmet? What are the different components that go into um, the different types of helmets we might be using? Right, so, so what I have here is, is a hockey helmet. And really the goal of this helmet is to have the helmet absorb the energy of a collision either between two players or let's say the, the puck and the player. And we can see there's really two components. There's this hard shell on the outside. And then on the inside here, uh, you see this in gray here, throughout the inside of the helmet, we have this foam-like material on the inside. Yeah, so that kind of leads to an interesting question of what are those foams and those shell materials made of? Well, the shell is made of a material typically called uh, vinyl nitrile, which is a blend of polyvinyl chloride, which you can see on the, the screen there that Dominic has shared, and uh, acrylonitrile butadiene rubber, as you can also see on the screen there. And PVC, uh, many of our viewers have probably encountered PVC in multiple places. So if you've done any, any plumbing work, you've probably seen PVC pipes in your house. Uh, even uh, many vinyl records are made of PVC. Uh, in fact, PVC is the third most produced polymer in the world by volume. Yeah, that's actually really uh, fascinating. So I can sort of see why the you know rigidity of say a, a PVC pipe we use for plumbing might translate to a good uh, shell type material for a helmet. That's, that makes sense. What about this acrylonitrile butadiene? Um, we've seen that before, haven't we? Right, so this, uh, this acrylonitrile butadiene that's used in this foam here, we've seen that acrylonitrile butadiene in the nitrile gloves that we examined in our earlier episode. Yeah, okay, so we sort of got an idea about that. Uh, what about the sort of foam layers? You know, what are, what are those made of? Right, so the, this, this cushioning foam are made of two materials, so vinyl nitrile and uh, polypropylene. And our viewers may actually remember that uh, polypropylene is the same material used to make surgical masks and also N95 masks. Yeah, okay, so, you know, same sorts of polymers used in lots of different applications, right? We sort of got our polypropylene used in, you know, surgical masks or some of the cushioning type applications. I guess the difference is that, you know, if we're gonna be doing a foam, we're gonna be filling our material, be that uh, vinyl uh, nitrile, be that polypropylene with air pockets, and it's gonna help cushion, um, you know, or, re you know, reduce the impact we might be experiencing. On the other hand, if we're gonna to try to make a mask, we're gonna turn those into fibers that we're gonna to use to make um, a mask or another like, you know, material, like fabric type material out of that. Okay, so, so what about a bike helmet? Yeah, actually, so a similar concept applies to a bike helmet, right? So I've got a bike helmet here. You know, again, we sort of have this shell layer and we have a foam layer in between, inside there. We see the foam, we can see the shell. 
And so again, similar concept applies. We've got a shell, we've got a foam, but the materials are a little bit different. A lot of the time the shells are gonna be made of uh, polycarbonate. Okay, so we're gonna have polycarbonate, which actually we saw in one of our previous videos there. A lot of the time safety glass is also made of polycarbonate. And then a lot of the time we're gonna have a foam made out of polystyrene. We can see the structure of polystyrene here. And that's what we're typically gonna be using for a lot of our sort of um, bike helmet type applications. Right, and I think, you know, these are all really interesting examples of how polymers are so versatile, right? Because we can use the same or maybe related polymers in so many different types of applications. So think about, you know, the design of helmets because we expect them to protect us from acute impacts. We have this, you know, they have this rigid outer layer and then we have this sometimes relatively cushioning or firm foam on the inside. Uh, you know, that, that really changes when we start moving towards materials designed to protect us from uh, sustained but lower intensity dangers such as loud noises. Right, and in those cases if, you know, we really don't need the impact protecting, you know, properties, right? We're not expecting a lot of, um, you know, impacts coming at us. We're simply looking at dissipating the sound energy, right? So the energy coming at us in the form of sound, we want to dissipate that out, um, you know, protect us from that. So it sounds like in those cases, really just a foam should be sufficient, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of why these uh, earplugs, uh, those there are simply a foam-like material. They're all foam, there's no shell on that. And in those cases there, uh, like these ones here, are actually made of something called memory foam. We can sort of see that if I squeeze it, it sort of holds its shape for a little bit of time, but it, if we come back to it in a minute or two, it'll actually return back to that sort of, um, you know, round-like shape there. So what is this type of foam made of? Yeah, it's actually a really uh, interesting that, uh, question. So in those cases there, um, the foam is typically made of polyurethane, okay? So we've got the structure of polyurethane put up here. And really it's designed so that, you know, it actually holds its shape temporarily, uh, but eventually can actually mold to the shape of the, um, you know, mold to the shape of the environment around it. Right, so that's that's really what lets the, the user take these and squeeze the foam down to fit them in the air and then really have that material uh, expand back to match uh, the, the shape of the individual's ear. Right, you know, and because our foam is viscoelastic, right, uh, it's got pretty good energy dissipating properties. Maybe, maybe thinking about that, how, how good are these? Well, the ones I have here, so these green uh, ones here are uh, rated at 33 uh, decibel noise reduction. So if we keep in mind that the decibel scale is actually a logarithmic scale, okay? So that means every unit that we go up is actually not a linear increase, but it's actually a factor increase. They're actually still pretty substantial reduction in energy. So a 33 decibel um, earplug should lead to approximately a thousand time energy reduction. That's a that's an impressive amount of energy uh, cushion from the air, and that's really it's all because the material is acting a bit like uh, the peanut butter that you had earlier, uh, you know, absorbing the sound uh, energy and not propagating it down the ear. Yeah, so that's kind of where you know, hopefully, you know, we've learned a little bit about. Um, energy absorbing materials and hopefully you've enjoyed this video on cushioning and energy absorbing um, you know characteristics that we impart into our materials. Of course energy absorbing materials have far more applications you know we just listed a couple here that you know highlight some of the properties you know in terms of earplugs and helmets but you know there's many 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 more applications that we can think of. Right, so uh, you know, in our next video videos, we're gonna take a bit of a turn from polymers in PP applications, and we're gonna move to polymers in the biomedical industry. So come check out our upcoming video on polymers in the body and biomaterials, and we'll catch you next time.